Hi, my name is Alexis Marshall and I'm currently a research fellow at the University of Waikato in Hamilton, New Zealand. And today as part of the Bioinformatics Virtual Coordination Network, I'm going to be taking you through a short tutorial on how to assemble RNA reads. This tutorial relies very heavily on the advice provided in the best practices for de novo transcriptome assembly with Trinity blog post, and you can find that through that link here. This blog was written by Adam Freeman and Nathan Weeks, and it goes through all of the steps involved in trimming and cleaning RNA data before you should assemble it. This is very important because RNA assemblers are based on de Bruin graphs, and if you have any erroneous kamers or poor quality reads that carry over, the assembler will try to use these to, to make, um, to try to assemble these reads. Uh, which will take the assembler a lot longer to provide reads that actually aren't of biological uh, value. And so within this, this blog here, it takes you through how to initially check your reads with FASTQC, how to remove these erroneous camas um, using our corrector, how to then go through and discard these reads that were identified as unfixable by our corrector, uh, there's a short um, Python script within the transcriptome assembly tools github here uh, that's provided as part of this tutorial uh, and this the scripts within here enable you to sort through the output of our corrector very quickly and just keep the reads that were deemed as high quality by our corrector. Uh, we then go through how to trim these reads and remove low quality bases. Uh, when you are looking through RNA data, uh, the FRED scores are looked at when you are trimming. And there's this really nice paper here by McMahons that goes through why we don't remove anything over a FRED score of five. Uh, I highly recommend reading this paper to get more understanding of that rationale. Uh, we also use the, the rapid trim galore to do this step. And that's because it's very good at picking up uh, carryover sequencing adapters and identifying other um, re reads that shouldn't be within your data set. We then come down here and identify uh, ribosomal RNA reads. Now this tutorial assumes that you want to remove these because a lot of RNA library preparation kits have a ribosomal RNA depletion step or a poly -A -tail, um, enrichment step. And so carrying over ribosomal RNA reads into an assembly uh, can take a lot, can mean that the assembler takes a lot longer to assemble and also they're unwanted, so we remove them. This tutorial here uses the Silver Database and Bowtie 2 to do this. In today's tutorial, I'm going to show you how to do this with Sort Me RNA. Uh, both of these approaches are valid. Uh, we're going to use Sort Me RNA because the BBCN has previously provided a tutorial on Sort Me RNA, and there's a little bit more in-depth information there for everybody. Uh, we're then going to go down and run Trinity very quickly with its base um, uh, requirements. I'm going to also show you how to uh, run initial statistics on the assembly just to see. What the, uh, what the average read length was that were generated. Okay, and so if we go back to the BBCN page, you'll see that we've provided you with uh, some links to some previous lessons on how to run FASTQC and MultiQC, and also the Sort Me RNA uh, link. And I highly recommend that you watch these if you are very new to this type of analysis. Uh, we've also provided you with two different data sets. The first here is an RNA data set generated from an environmental sample, so it's a metatranscriptome. In a later lesson, we're going to go through how to assemble this data set uh, and show you what the output from Trinity looks like, which is quite different from when you're doing a single species assembly. But today, we're just going to focus on this other data set we've given you that's a part of this paper here. Now this RNA-seq uh, data set is from the mealybug. Uh, it's a eukaryote, but this has a lot of uh, symbiotic bacteria that are co-associated with it, 
And so you find transcripts that are associated with both bacteria and eukaryotes within this data. For more information, I recommend that you watch this micro seminar talk here and it talks through this study in a lot more detail. And if you're interested in looking at the total data set, uh, the link here uh, takes you there. Uh, today's tutorial is based on a very small subset of this data. So once you're ready to run the tutorial, you just double click on this binder link here. The binder will take some time to load between five and 10 minutes. Uh, and that's because there's so much software and data associated with this tutorial, but just give it some time. And once it loads, you'll see an interface like this. Uh, for those who've done the uh, BBC and tutorial before, you'll be familiar with this. Um, but just if you haven't, uh, the terminal that we're going to be using today is just located down here in the bottom left. So you just double click on that and it will open up your terminal environment. Uh, this here reflects the contents of um, the directories within this uh, tutorial. And so if we just hit list or LS will work as well. Uh, it'll bring up the same contents here as it's seen over here. Uh, today's tutorial is located within data and paired end data. And so if we just change directory into data, tab out uh, to fill that, and then paired end, and then we can fill that. And you'll see that the structure of the contents of this directory matches this. The only difference is that here you can see the hidden folders. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is, firstly, we have to do some housekeeping to make the lesson work properly. And so if we double click on this setup notes file here, what will open is this notepad environment that goes through some of the some of the things that we have to do to get the tutorial to work properly. Uh, what I've given you here is the programs that are preloaded for you within this binder environment and the links to their websites. I highly recommend that you go and read the manuals for each of uh, these programs and get a better idea of how they work and how they might best work with your particular data sets. Uh, MultiQC, FastQC, SortMeRNA, CutAdapt, the Rapid Trim Galore for CutAdapt, Jellyfish R Corrector and Trinity are all loaded. Uh, before we begin, however, we do have to index the Sort Me RNA databases. And to do that, the easiest way to do that actually is to reload Sort Me RNA from GitHub and to just index those databases this way. And so what I've got here is a couple of uh, lines of code that make a new directory called programs moves into that directory. It also clones that transcriptome assembly tools um, set of Python scripts from uh, Adam Freeman's GitHub. And then it also will go into sort me RNA and do the same thing from that GitHub. What we then do is we change directory into uh, data within the sort me RNA uh, folder and we make a new directory called index. And once we've done that, we can run this piece of code here that will provide an indexed database for each of the FASTA files that are provided by sort me RNA. So you need to do this step before you can successfully run sort me RNA uh, to check whether or not you have any carryover ribosomal RNA in your data. In your data. Once that's finished, uh, we just change directory back up into the directory where uh, sample reads are located. And then we make um, a few new directories that we run with the QC Trinity script over here. So these are all output directories. Now this is a particular personal preference. Um, it just means that everything's a little bit more tidy uh, because a lot of these, a lot of the programs that were run today have uh, a lot of output files. There's log files, there's fastq files, there's the actual output files that we're interested in. And when you come back to your data in two or three months time, it just, it helps you work out where things are and it's just an easy way to say, oh, well, this was, this was all just um, trimming um, and cleaning steps. And then I went in and actually modified it 
in this first way, the second way, and then the assembly is the third that comes up. And the numbers just help keep these folders in order when you have them on a cluster. And so what we're going to do is you could run, so you could run each of these line by line if you wanted. We've already executed this particular piece. We changed into data, paired and data. Um, the other way, that, the way to do that would just be to copy and paste each of these lines into the terminal. The other way that we can run this script is directly from the terminal as a single piece. And the reason we can do that is because all of um, the text has been hashed out and so uh, bash or the portable bash script won't read these lines and it will just go through and execute all of these commands down here. So if we go back to the terminal, hit return a couple of times just to give us some space so everyone can see. And if we just go bash and then SE and then we can tab out to get it to fill, set up notes, hit return. Because that's written in the, the right format for the bash language, it will just execute all of those lines independently of me running them. So this step to set this all up into index so sort me RNA databases, it takes about uh, five minutes. And so while that's happening, I'm going to take you through the rest of the tutorial. So as you can see over here, we have two RNA read files, read one and read two. These are Illumina sequencing files. And so you get the two read outputs here. I also have this other script that I'm going to take you through in a second. And then you'll notice that there's two other files. Now these are SAM tool output files. And in a future lesson, we're going to take you through how to use these files. But today we're just focusing on these four bottom files here. And so if we open up this QC Trinity script while that's running, uh, what you'll see is a for loop. Now, uh, for those who haven't come across a for loop before, uh, the very basic description of what this does is as soon as you type for, you open up a loop essentially, and that it goes through and, I, and, and, I did, and makes a list of um, anything that you want, actually. I've called this prefix here just because um, it's easy to, uh, to work with, and a lot of our other lessons have gone with this naming convention but you can call this anything that you, anything that you want because you're just setting something. Uh, as you can see, we've called it down here. So you could call this file or uh, RNA sample. And as long as you put RNA sample within these brackets here, it will call whatever you've asked prefix to me. Uh, we've asked it to go in and list all of the files within this directory that end in one.fastq. And so as you'll see, there's only one file that's like that here. And so it will go through and find this file. And we've asked it just to cut the first and the second fields based on the delimiter that's a period or a full stop. So if you have a look at the way this file is named, you'll see that it's, if you break it up by the periods is one, two, three, four fields. And so all we're asking it to do is go, and find the first two, which is RNA underscore reads dot sample, and to make this a unique list. And so what will, what echo prefix will do was just push that to screen and you'll see that all prefix becomes then is RNA underscore reads dot sample. Read one and read two, however, need to be prefix dot one or prefix dot two. And that will then differentiate them from each other down here. Now this script then will uh, send some things to screen as we run it so we can, we can see how the script is running and which step it's up to. But then it will start um, by checking the rule reads that we've given it. So it will do, it'll start running fast QC on this read one here and read two. And as you can see, I've said, find whatever uh, R1 is in this instance, um, but the file is act actually has .fastq at the end of it. So that's the only thing that will, the, having this .fastq here is what will enable um, 
the terminal to identify that you're after this particular file. Uh, and then it will output to one of the folders we create, who created during the setup notes step called uh, raw reads. And so this will give us uh, a starting point for the quality of our sequence reads. And this is important because what you wanna see is how each of the following steps has impacted your original uh, read quality and how it's improved it or not improved it at all. The next step is to run our corrector. Um, as you can see, I uh, haven't changed um, the inputs that went into the, the step before because we're talking about the same file here. Uh, but this is actually going into a different output directory called corrected reads. Uh, our corrector will add corrected, uncorrect, unfixable or nothing to uh, a, the um, sample information panel on each of your fast queue each of the reads within your FASTQ file. Uh, and so what we, after we've run this step, what we need to do is go into this folder that we, where we've just sent the output from our corrector and run the script that we just pulled from GitHub um, from the transcript dome assembly tool called filter uncorrected head in FASTQ files. This file do, goes through and identifies those reads that are deemed unfixable and removes them from your, your sample file. Um, the reason we need to move into this directory to do it is um, it's the easiest way to execute the script without having to modify it because at the moment it doesn't have um, the ability to easily go in and, and tell it that you want to go into a particular directory to, to execute. And so I've just done this because it's the easiest way to get this script to run. Uh, without having to make too many changes. So yeah, so we tell it to call Python to uh, run this script on these particular samples. And the S flag is just a sample name flag and we can use R1 or you can use R2 if you want because there's no, nothing appended uh, to the end of it here. And it's just for a sample and naming convention. Here we just change back up one directory back to where we were before. I ask it to echo some more information to tell us where we're up to. Run fast QC again on these quality, on these R corrected quality checked reads. Uh, R corrector will call them unfix removed uh, and then output the fast Q output into the corrected reads database. Running fast QC on after each step is really important, and you'll see that um, it, at the end because you want to be able to track what each step does. Uh, so that's why I'm re running it repeatedly. Uh, I then ask it to echo again to screen that it's moving into cut adapt with uh, the wrapper trim galore. Um, trim galore has a few different um, output um, requirements that it needs. Um, but if you read the uh, best practices blog in detail and refer to the paper by McMahon, where is it? You'll see that we don't trim at a high quality um, threshold. Um, base pairs that are below a FRED score of five get removed, but anything above that is maintained. Uh, and so that's what this step is doing. So quality of five, it's also removing lots of short reads. So these are things like uh, primers that may have carried over or sequencing adapters that might be just within there. Um, and it's doing a few other things, looking at uh, stringency and e-values. Um, but by all means, the, this blog goes through this in a lot more detail and so does this paper. Once we've moved through that step, we then rerun FastQC on the output of, um, of Trim Galore and then we need to go into these trimmed reads and before we can successfully run sort me RNA, we need to interleave the reads together into one file. And so that's what this step is doing, this merge paired read step. We then go through and execute sort me RNA against all of the databases that are provided. Uh, 
most of my work is using metatranscriptomics from environmental samples and so I am interested in identifying all types of ribosomal RNA reads that might be present for each of your purposes. You might just be interested in one of these groups so you don't have to search against all of these databases and you can just uh, remove them from this piece of code if you want. Uh, once this is finished I get it to um, put the ribosomal RNA reads into one file and the non-ribosomal RNA reads into another file and it's this non-ribosomal RNA output that we're going to assemble and we then echo again that we've um, we've finished and that we're going to unmerge these pattern reads and that's just so that um, we, when we run Trinity we can put in left and right reads uh, based on its preferences. Uh, we then run FastQC for one last time. Once we've run that on our final um, unmerged and ribosomal RNA depleted sample, we can then run MultiQC on all of the FastQ file, FastQC output files that we've generated in each of the steps. Uh, this flag here uh, is just to make sure that MultiQC only looks within the directories that we've created that start with a zero. So you can see those here. Uh, if you don't add this, it will actually look through programs and go into the sort me RNA file. And there's some files in there that it recognizes and uh, it, it will break this part of the code. So that's why that's added here. Once that's run, we then change into our assembly folder and then we can run Trinity. And so Trinity here is uh, you add that it's a fast cube input, you put in your left reads, your right reads, and we have a memory limit here, and that's just based off uh, the, the binder environment. There's not uh, a large memory allocation here, so this just makes sure that, that Trinity doesn't uh, fail at any point in time. Once Trinity has finished, we then run the Trinity stats um, Perl script, that then will tell us what the uh, average size of our assembled transcript reads is, and then it will finish. And so if we go back into our terminal, you'll see not only has this finished because um, you can see the prompt come back up, but that it's made these folders here that I asked it to do before. Um, what we can now do is just like before, you could run this script um, in, independently, uh, line by line, sorry, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to do it that way, I would remove this and add in your sample names. Um, I'm going to run this as one piece. If you wanted to apply this to your data set, one of the recommendations that I have is that I wouldn't run this on more than one pair of reads, so uh, one sample set, uh, just because uh, if you're going to run this as a loop through multiple samples, let's say you have an experiment of 12 samples that you're running through, it will run through all of these steps once for one sample, then come back up and run again through the second sample, and then come back up and run again through the third sample. And this is okay if you only have samples that uh, uh, don't have many reads in them, but once you increase the read number and all, all the complexity of the data set, each of these steps can take a really long time. And so running this script on one particular sample pair uh, will actually make it run a lot faster because you can run multiple jobs at the same time. Now this is really dependent on the platform that you're using. Uh, if you're in a cluster on your own computer, uh, you need to take into account if you're going to what your computer requirements are. And the R corrector actually takes a lot of memory and a lot of time, especially on complex data. So uh, just be aware of that. Also, sort me RNA can, can take um, quite a while, depending on how many ribosomal RNA reads you have and how many reads it has to, um, sorry, to, to sort through. Uh, so I would run this script on one sample pair uh, at a time and not run it through a whole list of samples, which you can uh, use this for as well. The other thing that I would do is I would remove these lines here from this script 
and I would run this separately if I had more than one sample. Uh, this is in here at the moment um, for this lesson and also because we're only assembling one sample today so it makes it easier just to keep it in here. Uh, Trinity also can, the first, Trinity can be run in two separate phases. Uh, the first phase um, can be quite memory intensive, so that's something to take into consideration based on your data. Um, the second phase uh, doesn't require a lot of memory, and, um, but takes a lot longer and produces a lot more files. And so you can split them up um, depending on what you're using it for and whether or not it's easier for you uh, to run the first step in a short period of time with a high amount of memory and then the second parts with less memory but for a longer period of time. Okay, so if we go back here, what we can do is, uh, actually the first thing that I'll show you is that not only are all those uh, folders here created, but we have this programs directory. So we go in here, we'll see that this transcriptome assemblies tool, tools folder has been downloaded from Git and so has the sort me. And if we, sorry, we just move in there as well. Uh, you'll see that, I need to go down one more, so oops. That I, there's this indexing directory that we made and the ribosomal RNA databases directory that was downloaded. And if we move into index, you'll see all of the indexes that we made as part of this step. Okay, so if we, how many directories did I go down? All right, so here we are. So if we run um, bash, QC script, tab out, return. This will just start uh, running all of those steps we just went through before. Uh, this is the initial sort me RNA quality checking occurring. Um, it's quite quick because it's only a small data set. You can see that the echo moving to our corrector has been put to screen. Uh, so you can tell that it's moved into another, another part of the script. Uh, as you can see, there's some temporary files that are being created over here by our corrector. Uh, as that moves through, these will disappear. Uh, as I said before, depending on the complexity of your data, this step can actually take a really long time. Um, so just be mindful of that when you run it on your own data sets. Um, that's moving through. As you see that it's done 61,000, corrected 61,000 bases, which is great doing its job. Uh, those temporary files have now disappeared. It's gone back into FASTQC. Now it's running cutadapt. Uh, it's identified uh, that 21,000 reads had adapters, um, but the majority of them actually all of them passed the filter. And so it's generating a little bit more information about what it's identified and also the outputs from this step. And we're moving through here. Uh, running FASTQC again, and then you'll see here that it's moved into sort me RNA. This step can take a little bit of time to run, so while that's running, I'll just show you some of the output. So if we just go into this top folder here, you'll see that you have all of the, the corrected file output from um, this step. You also have a log file that's been generated and all of the details associated with that step are here. So if I hadn't pushed these into their own subdirectories, not only would all of these files be in the main directory, but all of the files associated with all of the other steps would also be there. And when you have lots of samples, this can become a little bit chaotic. And so this here is the output from FASTQC. And so we can just double click on that to check it at the moment. You can see here, um, this is um, the HTML environment for FASTQC. And so we have to click Trust HTML for the images to come up in the binder. So if we just scroll down, just zoom out a little bit here. Um, what it's showing us here is that the average quality score, the FRED score for um, our read is quite high across the read, which is what you want to see. Um, it's also showing us that the quality scores are quite good. Uh, it's showing here actually that the per base sequence content is failing. 
Now I'm going to touch on this because this is something that will continue throughout our RNA reads before we go into assembly. Now what this is actually is most likely carryover artifact from the library preparation. Most RNA sequencing libraries use random hexamers to generate cDNA and it's been shown actually that these random hexamers do have a slight bias for particular bases. So that's why you see um, these patterning of the AC, T and Gs in the first kind of 10 bases and you don't see it afterwards. Now if this particular pattern was to carry throughout the read that would be cause for concern and we would have to go in and, and check and understand why that was occurring. But this actually is quite common and um, I wouldn't particularly stress too much about this. Now, there's a really great blog post here about positional sequencing bias uh, and it goes through this in a lot more detail and talks about how the first uh, 10 to 12 bases of the run have some slight bias based on random priming. So if we head back here, uh, you can see the GC distribution. Uh, if you want any more information on these steps and why they're passing and failing, uh, please go on to the FastQC website. They have a lot of great detail on what each of these uh, metrics means and what you should and shouldn't be worried about for particular data, rate, data sets. Um, all right, so if we go back to the terminal and just see what's happening, Okay, great, we've moved into Trinity now. So if we just scroll up a little bit, what you can see is that um, sort me RNA ran and completed and that FastQC ran again and then Trinity has started and it's using uh, these read one, read two samples from the sort me RNA, ribosome RNA depleted sample set and then it's going to run through the first phase of Trinity here, which is clustering of the reads, running jellyfish, and then it will move into the second phase, which is the assembly phase. And now while that's completing, what we'll do is we'll actually go back and have a look at the multi-QC output, because that should be finished now. So if we just go back up one level, uh, and then you'll see here this multi-QC report. So if we double click on this, and go trust HTML again. What you'll see here is it's gone through and picked up every quality um, file that we've generated and also some more log files from each of the particular um, programs that we ran. And the great thing about MultiQC is it allows you to compare what each step has done, how the data has changed over the course of the quality um, checking steps. Uh, you can see here that this um, merged sample um, this particular, when we interleaved our samples together, we had a really high uh, amount of ribosomal RNA percentage and that that's kind of, that's been removed um, for the reads that went into the assembly here. You'll also notice quickly here that the GC content has increased and that's because these ribosomal RNA reads have been removed. So it's gone up from 56 to 58. Um, you'll also see here that in the millions of sequences, a lot of it has been removed. It's not reporting it up here anymore. Uh, we'll find that out in a second. So here you'll see that CutAdapt has its own output. Um, it's telling you how many um, part that passed the filter. So it looks pretty good. Um, we've got some more output here. You can see sort me RNA gives you an output too, and it's showing you that the majority of the data match to the 23S here in the green. And then you also have this uh, the 16S database and some 5S here as well. And so that's done a good job there. And when you move down here, you can see sequencing counts. Um, most of the steps didn't impact sequencing count too much, but as you come down here, sort me RNA did remove a substantial amount of reads. And so what actually goes into the assembly is only a fraction of what was sequenced. And this is quite common. Um, the, and, and one of the reasons why we do a ribosomal RNA depletion or a poly a tail enrichment uh, before we sequence, just to improve what actually goes into the assemblies. Uh, we've got quality scores, they look good. 
Um, we've also come down here to this per base sequence content. And as I said before, uh, it's going to fail um, because of that random, um, that bias in the random hexamers. And you can just see where that is down here. You see that the GC content has shifted. Um, the other great thing about MultiQC actually is you can export and annotate um, these figures. And so if you want to send them to somebody or your own um, notes for future, you can export the entire report or just images by themselves. Um, you have duplication levels. Uh, the reads that went into the sequencing are much um, don't have a warning associated with them. They're the ones that passed. All of the others had a high number of duplicated reads, and this is because there was a large amount of ribosome RNA still within that data set. As you can see, the, they've also passed the overrepresented sequences and so on and so on. And then you have this really nice summary down here of all of the um, all of the, the the quality metrics that were tested by FASTQC and the traffic light system for whether a green for something that passed and orange for a warning and red for whether or not failed. And, and the samples here down the bottom um, that went into the assembly passed the majority of the steps um, but failed at that per base sequencing step and, um, and that's because of the random hexamers. Okay, so let's go back and see if this has finished. Okay, it's still running. Um, this particular step within Trinity can take a little bit of time. Uh, and so I might just pause now and come back uh, once it's finished. Okay, so the tutorial has now finished and Trinity has given us um, all of its outputs, including that all of the commands completed successfully. Uh, it's also telling us that the transcript is, the assembly is written to this particular location under the uh, 03 assembly directory that I asked it to send the assembly to. And it's also telling us the location of a mapping file. Now this tells us how each of the isoforms of each transcript um, map to each of the overall transcripts or what they call uh, genes down here. And so down here, this is the output of that script that we ran right at the end. So here in the utilities folder of Trinity, it's a Trinity stats. And now this tells you information about the percentage of your bases that fall within a particular length of uh, assembled transcript. And so these are like the NX statistics. And so you can see here that 50% of the reads fall within a an assembled transcript that's more than 18,000 bases long. Tells you the mean quantic length, average quantic, and the total number of assembled bases. Now these are quite long, uh, and that's because it's an RNA-seq data set from the eukaryote. Uh, and the, what we would see if we were to assemble something that was more complex, like a metatranscriptome, these would most likely be much shorter based on that complexity. Uh, down here, it gives you stats based on only the longest isoform per uh, gene or per, like, main transcript. Uh, it tells you this because there can be some slight deviations in the isoforms that can impact these numbers and so it just gives you the output statistics again down here as well. And there are slight differences like especially in the mean quantity length that's 3805 in comparison to almost 15,000 here. Uh, if you want more information, um, Trinity has a very good uh, website here. Uh, this is just pulling up a particular part of this wiki that, tell, that goes through this, um, this NX statistics in more detail. Um, please read through this. The Trinity website is very helpful. There's lots of great um, work throughs on here that you can follow once you have your assembly. And also, if you're interested in learning about how to annotate a Trinity assembly, the, um, the follow on from here is to go to Trinitate which uh, has a lot of linked um, tutorials to using Trinity. All right, so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to get in touch.
and also on the BBCN website or the Slack channel that's associated with the BBCN and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have in association with this particular tutorial. Thank you.